This is the third video on the American Revolution. Uh, we are now at war. Blood has been spilled in Lexington and Concord. Jefferson, with some help from John Adams and Ben Franklin, has written the Declaration of Independence. We have declared independence and declared war on Britain. So before we go any further, there's uh, some really good background stuff here. And this is an important list on both sides for the British and Americans because later on during the Civil War, you have an almost identical list between the North and the South. And the question becomes, if these 13 disunited, ill-prepared uh, colonies, how can they possibly win a war against the world's superpower? Britain sends over the course of the war something like 150,000 soldiers at one time or another to America. The largest army we put in the field at any time was about 12,000. Later on at the very end, the French come in and help us. So how the heck do we win this thing? And you have to look at the basic game plan, the British and American advantages. Okay, so first list here, of course, I am working with slide number 43 and 44. Uh, are the British advantages. And I'm spending a little bit more time here than the textbook does because some of these are quite interesting and explains why we were able to win the war. First of all, population of Britain all the way through the 1700s is about 8 million. And when we talked about the demographics before the war, uh, America goes from a quarter of a million about 1700. In about 1770, she has two and a quarter million people. Now, if you have a quarter million population and you're fighting somebody with eight million, you don't have much of a chance. But if the ratio becomes one to four or so, then the, the odds are a lot better. And we had about a quarter of the population of Britain. Um, in any one battle, however, George Washington never has more than 8,000 men. So this is a tiny army. Um, Howe, General Howe, British General Howe in New York City had 150 ships come in. He has 32,000 men and George Washington has 7,000. And how many ships do we have? Zero. None. On the other hand, the population is certainly bigger in Britain, but it's a long ways away. So it's much harder for them to replace their men 3,000 miles away. Britain also has the largest and best navy in the world. France had the largest army, but Britain had the largest and best navy. Navy is a very useful thing, not only for moving troops by land or by sea, to move them from one part of America to the other, but also to blockade the coast, which is the number one thing Britain does. She blockades the Atlantic coast. She is trying basically to starve America out. Nothing can come in, nothing can go out, but of course, uh, we are very expert at smuggling by this time, too. Britain had something like 60. Um, no, I'm sorry. She had something like 100 ships of the line. These were major warships at the time. They were huge. They had crews of hundreds of men, five to 800 men on these ships, and anything from 60 to 100 guns on both sides. So these are huge, and two or three gun decks. So these are huge battleships, and they were fast because they had copper bottoms. One battleship in the British fleet took 2,000 oak trees to build, so it gives you an idea of the force behind this. The walls were so thick on some of these battleships that cannonballs would bounce off unless they got really close and could blast them from close range. Um, so oftentimes these sea battles, the ships are 50 yards apart. They're less than 200 feet apart because that's the only time that the cannonballs could really do damage and sink the other ship. Um, Master and Commander, about 10 years ago, good movie, uh, talks about the horrors of the British Navy and any Navy at the time. You could only use the Navy at certain seasons. It's a handicap they have because of, big surprise, hurricane season. So when hurricane season came around, the British Navy moved off, off the coast. They were not in action. Another advantage the British have is money. Um, as British Prime Minister said, money is the sinews of war. George Washington knew it as well, our commander in chief. The true point is not simply whether Britain can carry out the war. 
but whose finances are the most likely to fail. In other words, the winner will be the one whose money lasts the longest. And this is crucial to George Washington's strategy, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, there are almost no banks in America to provide the money. Uh, what we did to finance the war is print paper money. This is not a good plan because the British could pay with silver and gold. They had coin. They also have a much better taxing system. Remember, this war is over taxation, hard to tax Americans. British soldiers and British suppliers were paid in gold and silver. American suppliers were paid with paper money. It's no surprise the American army had a hell of a time trying to feed the troops because nobody wanted to take this paper money. If America loses, which most people thought they would, uh, the paper money you have is absolutely worthless. You can start a fire with it. So Britain is never short of supplies. Not only does she ship them over, she can buy them locally, whereas the American army at Valley Forge and during the winters is starving to death. We're in the middle, it was in the middle of the most uh, prosperous agricultural area in the country, and Washington could not buy food. He didn't have gold and silver. Um, the other thing money can buy that's very useful is mercenaries, hired soldiers. Britain has a lot of stuff. I call it stuff, <laughs> things. Um, if you have money, you can buy whatever you need, but Britain also produces a lot of stuff. Remember, she's been fighting France and other European countries for decades. So it's not surprising that there are places in Britain that manufacture cannon. Cannon is a huge advantage in a, a foot war, in a, an infantry war, which is what the revolution is. There is no place in America that manufactures cannon. We had to steal it. The other thing that is manufactured in Britain that we do not make in America are bayonets, which we never think about. A bayonet is basically a blade on the end of a gun, mounted on the end of a gun. These are not jackknives. These are an average of about 20 inches long. It's basically a small sword mounted on the end of a gun. Huge advantage because you can get the other guy before he gets you you have basically a 20 inch longer range. Uh, remember that all of these guns, they shoot once and they take a minute to reload. So it's pretty hard to avoid a charging army coming at you if they have 20 more inches of space that you don't have. And the British knew this, they capitalized on it, they used it all the time. They would uh, do several rounds, they would fire several rounds and then order a bayonet charge before the Americans could reload. And every single time the Americans would run like rabbits. I would too if I had a bunch of swords coming at me charging because I didn't have time to reload. <coughs> um, one British ship one of those big battleships had more cannon than the entire American army had at any one time. We just don't have the stuff. How do we get cannon? Later on in the war, the French army does provide our regular army with bayonets, but not the militia. And we get cannon because we steal it. Where did we steal it? From Fort Ticonderoga up near the Canadian border, very lightly fortified uh, British fort. Washington sends General Knox up to Fort Ticonderoga, sees the cannon, because he knows there's nobody up there to guard him pretty much. They do this in winter to get back to Boston. So basically from just south of the Canadian border to Boston, 300 miles in the winter, it takes them two months to haul about 50 cannon plus the cannonballs. Each cannon weighed about 5,400 pounds. They brought horses and wagons to haul them with. The snow was so deep that the horses and, and oxen uh, basically foundered. They couldn't walk in the deep snow and pull anything. So the men cut them loose and put ropes over their shoulder and towed the cannon on sleds back to Boston. A lot of them froze their feet. A lot of people died along the way, but at the end of two months, George Washington had his cannon and he mounted them on the hills above Boston. So any cannon we get, we pretty much have to confiscate from the British Army. Britain has the stuff because she has the factories. Not only cannon and bayonets, she has shoes and gun factories, uh, ammunition factories, 
There is nothing in America that manufactures arms and weapons. In fact, Ben Franklin at one time is suggesting maybe we should use bows and arrows. And this was seriously considered because there was no armaments, there was no ammunition in the American colonies. Britain has experienced troops and experienced officers. British troops have fought in European wars for decades. Uh, there is no part-time militia in Britain. If you're in the army, you are there full-time and you are training full-time, and the enlistments were for very long terms. So their soldiers are well experienced. When the firing started starts, they don't run away. They're used to it. British officers are an interesting case. The British officers also are well experienced, most of them. Again, they have been fighting for years and years. They went through an apprenticeship program and were trained. On the other hand, how did you get to be a British officer? You bought your assignment and you sold it when you were done and retiring. So this is where the younger sons of wealthy men go. The oldest son inherits the property. The younger sons either go into the ministry or into the army. There was a government pension, but only for those who were disabled. So this is a mixed bag. There are some very good, uh, somebody, dogs barking, come to the door. Okay. Um, there are some very good British officers. There are some very incompetent British officers because they bought their office. They didn't rise through quality. The American army, on the other hand, is under the control of George Washington, and George Washington had the power to appoint whoever he wanted, to promote and demote officers, um, which he does. So from the beginning, George Washington can appoint men of quality and men who very quickly learn how to fight, learning by doing, in a way. Um, good indication of this is our commander of artillery, Cannon, who is General Henry Knox, who got those cannon from the Canadian border. He is an overweight, something like a 45, 50 year old bookseller from Philadelphia, who would never, the British Army wouldn't have looked at him. He volunteers to help George Washington. George Washington puts him in command of a few of the cannon that he brings back, and he turns out to be brilliant. He's a brilliant strategist. He had no military experience, none. How did he learn this? He read books. So he knew about artillery from reading books and turned out to have a real knack for it. Another person that the British Army never would have looked at ever was Nathaniel Green from Rhode Island. He had a pretty serious limp, number one, that disqualified you from the military, and he was a Quaker. The war came along and he said, I'm sorry, I'm not a pacifist, I'm going to fight for the Americans. A few Quakers did. And he turned out with no military experience to be very, very talented, very bright mind, very strategic in terms of tactics. Uh, Washington immediately promotes him. The fact that he has a serious limp doesn't bother anybody. And he became Washington's second in command, his right hand man. The British also have allies. Um, they have what we call then and now loyalists or Tories, Tory being the British political party. Loyalists are just what they say. They are loyal to Britain all the way through the war. Estimates, and it's very hard to figure this out. Uh, John Adams is famously quoted as saying, in America, we are one-third Tories, one-third true blue, and one-third timid. We think the ratios are more like one out of four committed to the Patriot cause, to independence, one out of four loyal to Britain all the way through the war, and probably two out of four don't really care, just leave us alone and let us farm. We'll go with whoever wins. This is a huge advantage. They are good for spies, for intelligence. Um, they help the British cause. They uh, house the British officers in their homes, a real advantage. Another group, that is helpful to the British are pacifists. Who's pacifists? Remember those Quakers. It's no accident that the British headquarters for the second half of the war is in Philadelphia. Why? They had nothing but trouble in Boston. 
Philadelphia is full of Quakers. They don't fight. So very large group of Quakers in America, particularly in Pennsylvania. Hessians, Hessian, Hess is a German province, so the Hessians were hired German mercenaries. Estimated, we don't know exactly, but estimated a third of the British army are Hessians, are hired German mercenaries. They estimate about 17,000. Remember Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration talks about the Scots and foreign mercenaries. That's what he's talking about. Indians who are great at guerrilla warfare, not so great in regular battle, but great at guerrilla warfare and great at uh, espionage and spying, um, they know darn well to side with the British, and most tribes did. Americans are not their friends. They know if America wins, they're gonna be pushed off, they'll be slaughtered. The US Army during the beginning of the war burned 40 towns of the Iroquois. So very few tribes did fight for the American side. Most of them logically went with the British. The other interesting factor, a uh, couple interesting factors, Britain would pardon Americans if they declared loyalty to Britain, and especially if they would fight or help the British. So if you wanna hedge your bets, that was one thing you could do. And the other interesting factor are slaves, of which there are something like 400,000 when the revolution breaks out. Very early in the war, Britain promised freedom. You come and join the British army, you come and help us, you will be freed. And there was at least one all black regiment of over 500 who fought for the British along with hundreds of other individual slaves. The, that regiment had a sash that they wore on their uniform that said, Liberty to Slaves. Thousands fought for the British, including some of George Washington's own slaves and some of Thomas Jefferson's own slaves. At the end of the war, Treaty of Versailles, it was written into the treaty that Britain should return American quote unquote property, which meant of course slaves, because slaves are property. And the British did a very honorable thing. They took the slaves that fought for the British army away with them. They did not leave them to be re-enslaved. They took them, a few went to Britain, some went to the Caribbean. Large numbers were taken to Canada and freed in Canada. And I have been in a couple of areas in Canada where there were free black settlements from the 1700s and their descendants are still there. So Britain clearly has the stuff, if you wanna use a shorthand. What does America have that allows us eventually to win this war? We have some crucial factors, not the stuff. <laughs> we have home ground advantage. It is our turf. We know the terrain. We know how to live off the land. We can move much faster. It's also a shorter supply line. We don't have to send stuff 3,000 miles across the ocean or wait for orders or reinforcement for six months to go back and forth across the ocean. What George Washington sees in the beginning from the first, and this is the factor that allows him to continue without giving up under horrible conditions, is that America has time and space on her side. It took the British seven years to conquer the 75,000 French in Canada. Why? Canada's a big place. Britain, to conquer the 13 colonies, has to occupy them and has to hold them. America is 95% rural, few cities. We have no capital here. Philadelphia is the largest city. There's no government to capture. You can go ahead and take a territory. The minute you turn around and leave, they come back again. It was very difficult to occupy and hold any part of America. Um, as Nathaniel Green said, we fight, we get beat, we rise and fight again. It's almost impossible. This is a huge space, four times the size of Britain, for even a very large British army to conquer. The other factor that's crucial that Washington sees is that hearts and minds. Uh, is what we called it in Vietnam. Americans are fighting for a cause. This is their homeland. This is their families. This is not a paycheck to them. 
over the period of the war, approximately 200,000 American males served in the U.S. Army. This is roughly one half of the adult males in the country at the time. So this was a cause that a lot of Americans stood for. This, this is an invasion, and people fight to defend their homes. Uh, Nathaniel Green, again, uh, I wrote a biography of him, very interesting. Um, totally dedicated to the war. He did take his wife on occasion, but his kids, his wife, were someplace else for years at a time. George Washington is home two days out of eight years during the war, totally dedicated. Nathaniel Green wrote at one point, I haven't had my clothes off for six weeks straight. It wasn't a very aromatic army, uh, American army. Um, one German officer wrote of the Americans, soldiers in the army were composed of every age, even of children of 15, of whites and blacks, almost naked, unpaid, rather poorly fed, that they can march so well and stand free and stand fire so steadfastly is amazing to us because they were fighting for a cause. They were fighting with their hearts and not for a paycheck. Um, literacy is a factor, and we always forget that. Literacy is very important. Uh, America is one of the more literate places in the world. We had twice the literacy of Britain, and Britain had twice the literacy of almost any place else in Europe. Benjamin Franklin said, every man among us reads, a slight exaggeration, particularly for the South, but most American adult males read. Totally free press, why is literacy important? You can persuade people, you can convince people. You can also send directions and follow directions if you are literate. So this is a cause that is promoted and that people read about and decide to support. American officers, I mentioned before, um, George Washington promoted strictly by merit. This is a great line from a British uh, actually an American officer. In Britain, one becomes an officer because you are an aristocrat. In America, you become an aristocrat because you were an officer. And I gave you some examples of that. Another key American factor, very American still today, is that we adapt. Britain never changed tactics. Whatever worked in Europe was supposed to work in America. British soldiers were sent into the war with 60 pound packs of food and supplies. And of course, bright red uniforms, what doesn't do too well in the middle of the dark green woods. And these uniforms were made of good British wool. It's not surprising that when they get down to North and South Carolina and Georgia towards the end of the war, that their soldiers are dropping dead from heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Um, they never changed tactics, they never changed uniforms, they never changed the way they fought. British have a lot of allies, but so do the Americans. And the key phrase here is a very famous French one, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Everybody in Europe doesn't like Britain because she is the world superpower at the time. So everybody in Europe would love to have Britain cut down to size. So they're happy to help America. Our first ally, of course, is France. Um, even though she's Catholic and America is not Catholic and she has a king. But France is happy to cut Britain down to help a rival of Britain. She sends first thousands of guns and 90% of our gunpowder came from France. Uh, she would also love to have Canada back. If America wins, maybe France can get Canada back. Later on, she sends troops and the French Navy, which was crucial to the end of the war. We could not have won the war without French help. Ben Franklin knows exactly what's going on. He's our man in Paris and he says, France means to keep her hand under our chin, to prevent us from drowning, but not to lift our heads out of the water. In other words, she wants America to win, not to become too much a strong nation, but just to hurt Britain. So she's gonna help us, but only the bare minimum. And thanks to Ben Franklin in Paris, she does. Spain comes in later, traditional enemy of Britain. Um, the Dutch come in, 
They are also competing with the British Navy as a great shipping company. They loan money, uh, not men, but a lot of money came from the Dutch, and John Adams is our ambassador there who's getting money from them. Many Irish German immigrants also came, some of them to fight, and German and Irish immigrants here also fought for the American cause. Individuals, a scattering of individuals come from all over Europe because the idea of democracy is a very enlightenment idea and they believe in the concept. We all know, of course, about General Lafayette, who came as a 19-year-old from France because he admired the American Revolution. Uh, when he died, he asked in his will that he be buried in American soil. He is buried outside Paris, but they sent a box of dirt from Virginia so he could be buried in American soil. His family was later massacred in the French Revolution, interestingly enough. Uh, von Steuben, who trains our army, is from Prussia, is from Germany. Uh, we had German engineers with artillery skills because we have no experience with cannon. We didn't have any. One factor for Lafayette may be that his father had been killed 20 years earlier when he was just an infant by a British general. So maybe there's a revenge factor here. Not all slaves helped the, the British. Some helped the American army, about 5,000. Estimate anything from six to 10% of the American army was black during the revolution. In the beginning, George Washington was totally against it. No slaves, not doing this. Remember, he's a southerner and a large slave owner. Um, only free blacks could fight. But later on, he changes his mind. Maybe he saw how free blacks fought. Maybe they got shorter troops, not sure. But he allowed runaway slaves and free blacks to fight. Slaves would be free if they fought for a year in the Revolutionary Army, and they could also substitute for white soldiers. They volunteered, they volunteered for one reason, to get their freedom. This is a war over freedom. Did we keep our word? Yes, we did. We freed them, the British freed them too. Both sides kept their word to the slaves. Germans and other officers said the African Americans were the best soldiers, the best guides, and the best spies because nobody expected a slave to do that kind of stuff. George Washington's plantations himself, he lost 17 slaves, some to the British, some to the American cause. He never regained them after the war. Um, the other factor that helps, we do have some women, about 400, that actually fought in the American army, some of them as soldiers, which says a lot about military conditions then. They bound their breasts, they tied their hair back, and everybody thought they were just young boys. Many went along with their sweethearts or their lovers or their husbands or their brothers or whatever. There's hundreds and hundreds of cooks, of washerwomen that follow the troops, and also, of course, of prostitutes. Any army has prostitutes following it. The British, not everybody, supports the British cause in the war including both of the Howe brothers, who are key generals in the war, really were very sympathetic to the American cause. There were other people in high places in Britain who sympathized with the American cause, who thought that they really were being trodden upon. Um, there were some British Army officers in the British Army who refused to serve in America. Send me to India or someplace else. Uh, William Howe, Army commander for most of the war, had a number of mistresses, plural, in New York City. Um, whether they spied or not, we don't know, but he was clearly very sympathetic to the American cause. Militias, militias are citizen soldiers. This is a plus and a minus for the Americans. These are volunteers. George Washington hated them because they were totally undisciplined. He pulled his hair out and complained all the time. They were very short enlistments. They would appear if they were needed, and then they disappeared completely. He called them nasty, dirty, and raw troops. So they're helpful because they increase your troop strength, but again, they're not under military control most of the time. Another interesting factor that's an American advantage, and this is actually statistically true, that American men were bigger and healthier 
because of their diet. They had a lot more meat and protein in their diet. And it was said again by a British officer, an American eats three times the amount of animal food than the same class of people in England. They were several inches taller than the British soldiers, possibly an advantage. It is definitely an advantage and commented on by British officers all the time that the Americans were probably, we don't have statistics, better shots. Why? Everybody in America is handling a gun by the age of five. Everybody hunts. So they were well experienced with firearms. The British were largely drafted from cities and in Britain, it's my alarm going off, almost no one was allowed to own a gun. So they get a couple weeks training and they are sent to fight. So this is a huge advantage. Okay, I better stop there and we'll finish up that list and talk about the progress of the war in the next video. Stay safe out there.